Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Conversations 2021. I'm Scott Lotus, President and Executive Director of the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. And here we are again, a year later, still online, still connected across a wire as our banner photograph from the John Bjorkland Collection so beautifully illustrates. We'll see more from Bjorkland this afternoon, uh, but right now, on behalf of everyone at the Center, thank you for joining us. We're so glad you're spending this Saturday with us. Many of you have helped make this event possible through your volunteer efforts and with your generous financial support as conference patrons. Thank you. You can see a full list of our patrons and volunteers in the event program. And I'd especially like to thank the Tom E. Daly Foundation and Michael Schmidt, whose grants last year funded our year's subscription with the WebEx events platform, which we've been using for all of our online events. I know a couple of quick housekeeping notes about that. You do have some different options to customize your viewing experience, and you can access those options by clicking on the round button at the upper right-hand corner of your main viewing window. At the lower right, there are buttons to access the chat and the Q&A features. Please use the Q&A feature to send in your questions for our presenters, and be sure to select all panelists as the recipient when you do that. Haley and I will collect your questions and feed them to the presenters during the Q&A questions. I think we have a great day in store for you. And even as we continue to miss getting together in person, there does seem to be some light signifying the end of this long tunnel we've been going through. And I have to admit that there's also been a lot of light along the way during this past year. Through so many unprecedented challenges, the center has continued to grow in nearly every possible way. We've accessioned more photography into our archives and taken on new projects and new personnel. More of you have signed on as members and supporters, and our budget has continued to grow. For our fiscal year that ended on December 31st, our total income was up 3% compared to the year before. We even finished the year with a small surplus. We have no debt, and we have an endowment fund whose principal has grown to more than $2.5 million. We have excellent financial oversight from our uh, endowment committee, as well as professional fund managers, and our endowment makes annual distributions to the center, typically at four and a half percent. That contributes about $90,000 to our annual budget and provides really stable and secure funding for all of our programs going forward. I'm gonna go ahead and start my screen share so that I can uh, introduce you to our wonderful board of directors. Let's see here. All right. We have exceptional stewardship and governance, thanks to our 16 member board. And that number has grown during the past year too. With the recent additions, Ronald Albatore, Betsy Fallman, and Justin Franz. It is my privilege and honor to work for and alongside these women and men. And several of them will be introducing our presenters later today, so you can see some of their faces as well. Now, since diving headfirst into the world of online events last April, we've been offering at least one presentation every month. The response from our presenters and attendees alike has been incredible. We've had the opportunity to share some remarkable work while expanding our outreach and broadening our audience. Regardless of what the world looks like on the other end of this long tunnel, online events are here to stay at the center. And we've already scheduled two more. Todd Halamka will share his breathtaking photography and take you behind the scenes into how, with an architect's thinking, he visualizes his imagery. And that's on the evening of Tuesday, May 25th. And then just two weeks later on June 8th, we're going to take a deep look at the Monon Railroad with a program called Hoosier Lifelines. Mark your calendars for both. We'll open registrations later this month on our website at railphoto-art.org slash events. And you can also watch for our email blasts, as well as announcements on our many social media channels. In the meantime, you can view all of our online presentations from the past year on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash railphotoart. We'll post all of today's presentations there too, beginning the week of April 26th. And in addition to our own programs, we're once again teaming up with filmmaker Barry Fong whose work we, fe we featured in 2019 for the sesquicentennial of our first transcontinental railroad. Barry's film, Celestials, 
traces the lives and legacies of Chinese immigrants who helped build the Central Pacific Railroad. The pandemic delayed the premiere of his film, but it's now scheduled for Saturday, May 8th at 3 p.m. Central Time via Zoom. Barry will host a talk back after the screening, and you can sign up on our website beginning next week, also at railphoto-art.org slash events. And despite the complications imposed by COVID, some of our traveling exhibitions have remained on the road. After Promontory, our show about transcontinental railroading will open later this month at the St. Paul Union Depot. We have a few more exhibits on the road too, and we've recently developed online versions of three of our exhibitions. You can view them and get details about all of our traveling shows on the exhibits page of our website at railphoto-art.org slash exhibits, or by hitting that exhibit tab on the menu bar up at the top. If you scroll to the bottom of the main exhibits page, you can find links to those online exhibitions. And you can also find details about our current and forthcoming exhibitions in your conference program. Now, one person handles all of the logistics for our traveling and online exhibitions, as well as our events, including this one. She is Haley Page, our exhibitions and events coordinator, and I ran out of superlatives to praise her efforts a long time ago. Now, of course, I feel that way about all of our staff members. Please know how mightily each of them contributes to our success. We also have a small army of interns and contract archivists working on our collections, and you'll meet them and hear more about their efforts shortly. You'll see Haley later today too, as she and I will be tag teaming for the question and answer sessions. Haley also handles all of the submissions to our annual awards program, and she wants me to remind you that you still have time to enter. The deadline is May 1st, the theme is three of a kind, and you can find details on our website under the awards tab, as well as in your conference program. Now, one of my favorite projects from the past year was the COVID and creativity issue of our journal, Robert Heritage. We asked how you'd been staying engaged with your creative pursuits through the first few months of the pandemic, and your response was tremendous. You shared so much inspiring work that we had to expand the fall issue to what was then a record 84 pages, and that still wasn't enough space. So we added a web gallery too. I've been the editor for 33 issues of Railroad Heritage now, and this issue is one of my all-time favorites. Your submissions were a powerful reminder of the great depth of talent within our community. They're so powerful that we're now working on a book sourced primarily from your work. We don't have a formal title for it yet, but for now we're calling it Continuity and Change. Alexander Craighead and I are the co-editors and we're planning to publish it next year in 2022. Stay tuned. Before that though, we're publishing another book. It will be out this fall and it's one of the most ambitious we've ever undertaken. It builds upon the concept of the railroad and the art of place, which our board member David Taylor has emphasized and helped define through his photography and thinking. David has shared his concepts in articles, presentations, and in a book we published in 2016. But this time, we're expanding the narrative to showcase the work of 30 different artists and scholars, each of whom explores the visible and philosophical imprint of the railroad on the American landscape. We call it The Railroad and the Art of Place, an anthology. It features 230 photographs and 372 pages, hardbound at 11 by 11 inches, with the highest production of values available, and prepared by one of the best book designers in the world, our own Jeff Browse. Thanks to generous funding from the Kaler Family Foundation, we're able to keep the price down to $60 plus shipping. We're taking pre-orders on our website now at railphoto-art.org slash books. And we expect to begin shipping these copies by September. The cover photograph, by the way, is by Wayne Depperman. We have quite a few other books available too. And we've already tied that 84 page record with the last issue of Railroad Heritage. I'll be getting to work on the next issue later this month. And for my own sanity's sake, I'm hoping I might be able to keep it down to 68 pages this time, but I'm not sure. We always have so much great work available. Now you, our members and our supporters, make all of our work possible. If you're not a member yet, we hope you'll consider joining. You can sign up on our website, and there are details in today's event program. 
There are also details in your program and on our website about our Legacy Society, should you wish to make provisions in your will or estate plans to support our endowment fund. It's easy to do, it costs you nothing during your lifetime, and there's no minimum threshold. We gratefully welcome estate gifts of any size, even a fraction of 1%. We've adapted the Form 19 train order as the basis of our Legacy Society documentation, and we keep orders from our Legacy Society members in a handsome leather binder in our office. To learn more, get in touch with Inga Velton, our development director. And please let us know if you have orders for us. We will gratefully receive them. Estate gifts to our endowment support every aspect of our work, and especially our archives. Providing long-term care for the one-of-a-kind collections of photography and art requires significant financial resources, and our Legacy Society members give us confidence to, con to continue expanding our holdings, and expand them we have. Our collections are fast approaching half a million images. Now let me stop sharing my screen so that I can introduce our first presenter. Okay. So up next is the person managing this growth, Adrian Evans, our archivist. You're going to hear from her right now about our collections work. Adrian joined us in 2017 and quickly became an indispensable part of our team. She completed her master's degree in library information studies in 2014 at the University of Wisconsin. She then spent one year at the Image Permanence Institute in Rochester, New York, and two years at History Colorado in Denver before she joined us. She has great passion for historic imagery, and she has quickly learned the language of railroading, and a whole lot more that they didn't cover in library school, as we've worked together to build an archive from the ground up. It's my pleasure to introduce her now. Won't you please give a warm virtual welcome to Adrian Evans? Thanks, Scott. Um, so, hi, uh, Adrian Evans here. Uh, I'm the archivist at the Center for Railroad Photography and Art. Um, and in broad terms, my job is to facilitate preservation, digitization, and access activities surrounding our permanent collections. Um, I also help out with social media and answer image requests and help out uh, potential collection donors. Um, so just give me a minute here to share my screen and start my presentation. All right. So as Scott mentioned, uh, we currently hold uh, just under half a million images in our permanent collections, approximately 70% of which are digitized. Uh, photographers and artists represented in our holdings include the very well known, such as Jim Shaughnessy and Ted Rose, as well as vernacular photographers and talented hobbyists, such as Fred Springer and Leo King. Uh, you can find a complete list of our photographers and collections on our website. And today I'll be giving you some updates from the center's collections department, as well as showcasing some recently digitized images. Um, and this particular image is from our John Gruber collection, and it shows members of the Illini Railroad Club on an excursion between Chicago and St. Paul in 1961. So I always like to begin my collection update with some growth data from the past uh, 10 plus years. Uh, this just gives everybody a bit of perspective on how much the center's collections have really developed. Um, and since the last time I reported out to you guys in the fall of 2020, uh, collection numbers have held steady at a little under 500,000 images. However, in the intervening time, uh, we have made commitments to take on an additional 60,000 images. So I've updated our projected growth figure, which is represented by the furthermost uh, dot here on our graph, um, and updated it to 740,000 images. Now, that this doesn't mean we'll be taking on that much in 2021, but we will be taking on that much in 2021 plus the next few years. And regarding our most recent collection commitments, uh, we're still working out formal donor agreements, uh, so I won't announce anything new today. Uh, however, stay tuned to our social media channels. Uh, we'd love to celebrate publicly whenever we land a new collection, so if you're on there with us, you'll be the first to know. So in other collection uh, related news, uh, to support all of this growth, uh, we've added new members to our collections team. 
Um, if you've ever watched these presentations, so you're probably already familiar with intern Wesley Sondheim and archives associate Natalie Kresick, who have been with us for multiple years. Uh, but after Christmas, they were joined by a uh, contract archivist, Gil Taylor and Heather Sontag. Um, and finally, we've also added a couple of new interns to our team from the University of Wisconsin's iSchool, Valerie Lines and John Walker. Uh, and finally, I guess uh, you could consider this uh, the only non-human collection team member, uh, but last but not least is our new commercial dehumidifier, uh, which was recently installed at our archive storage space. Uh, this unit will be assisting us in maintaining a healthy relative humidity for our collections throughout the warmer months of the year. Now, getting on to, I think everybody's more favorite part of this presentation, uh, our recently digitized images. The Jim Shaughnessy collection has been our top processing priority over the last year. Uh, the whole collection contains approximately 90,000 images, which include glass plate negatives, films, slides, and prints. Uh, we've been focusing on the film negatives since last summer, and these are arranged alphabetically by railroad, so we track our progress letter by letter. Right now, we're wrapping up the C section, uh, which includes large series dedicated to both the Canadian National and the Canadian Pacific. So far, we've processed about 7,000 negatives, and we're about to start the Delaware and Hudson series. Uh, this was a favorite railroad subject of Shaughnessy's, um, so it does account for a good amount of the rest of uh, the film negatives. Um, so certainly it feels like the completion of the processing of the negatives is in sight, but we understand that we still have a lot to accomplish with this collection. And here we see a Canadian national worker alongside a steam locomotive 8218 in Fort Erie, Ontario on September 22nd, 1956. And just to move on with the Canadian national theme, as I mentioned, uh, it's one of the largest series we've processed, so you'll be seeing a lot of that today. Uh, here's one of Shaughnessy's fantastic night shots. Um, I feel like I would be remiss in sharing any Shaughnessy content without at least one of these. Uh, but this is Canadian National 1564 at Palmerston, Ontario on May 3rd, 1958. And here we have another Canadian national image. Uh, this is locomotive 6218, and this was shot during an excursion near Sherbrooke, Quebec on October 7th, 1967. And moving back stateside, uh, this is on the Batten Kill Railroad. Uh, it's a passenger train kind of traversing some lovely farmland in New York State. Uh, and we believe that this was shot in route between Eagle Bridge and Cambridge, New York in 1984. And then finally, um, this is a Central Vermont steam locomotive 703 at White River Junction, Vermont on August 29th, 1952. So moving on to some of our other processing priorities, um, the collection of our center's founder, John Gruber, has been amongst our top. Um, the collection contains approximately 109,000 images that date from the late 1940s to 2018. We started digitizing this collection in early fall and currently have our two interns working in tandem on it. Right now, um, we're surveying the slides in the collection and making some selections for digitization there while sim simultaneously digitizing the negatives to the item level. Uh, the negatives are arranged in chronological order, uh, and we've recently been working through 1961. It's been really enriching to see John Gruber's development as a photographer as we've reviewed the photos year by year. And in 61, he really seems to be hitting his stride. And just for reference, he was about 25 years old when he took the images you're about to see. Um, and this image is another excursion with the Illini Railroad Club. Here they're in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, on the Masabe Road on July 1st, 1961. Um, and here's an atmospheric shot uh, from John of the Milwaukee Roads uh, Copper Country Limited in Green Bay, Wisconsin on March 27th, 1961. And this is actually another shot uh, from the very same night. Uh, it's actually on the same roll of film as the previous image. Uh, I don't normally showcase two images taken so closely together, uh, but I just really love the sense of place you get here from the illuminated platform and the vintage cars in the image. And choosing between this one and the previous one, I had a hard time, so I felt compelled to share both. 
And again, uh, this is in Green Bay uh, on March 27th, 1961. Um, and here we have a North Shoreline image uh, from September of 61. Um, there's been some excitement surrounding the North Shore line uh, and John's coverage of it, so I felt I should share this as well. Uh, this is North Chicago Junction, located between Lake Bluff and Waukegan, Illinois. Uh, notably, this was one stop off from the Great Lakes Naval Station. Uh, John frequently shot at this location, so you usually do get to see some interesting images of passengers and men in uniform going to and fro on the trains. And then finally, of course, John is also well known for his uh, coverage of the Chicagoland area. Um, and this is kind of an iconic shot of a CTA train on the L in July of 1961 in Chicago. So another collection we've been working on is the Ron Hill collection. Uh, since December, contract archivist Heather Sontag has been working on processing the 23,000 color slides in this collection. And her work has included surveying, arranging, and recently a uh, digitization of the slides. Uh, the slides date between 1958 and 2014 and document North American railroads, mostly in the United States of the Mountain West, uh, but there is some Canadian coverage as well. And this image shows a Union Pacific freight train on Sullivan's Curve in California. Hill shot this image on October 16th, 1970. And uh, with the upcoming anniversary with Amtrak, I felt it was only appropriate to pull an Amtrak image as well for this presentation. Uh, this is Amtrak number six in Denver, Colorado on July 4th, 1974. And then here we have uh, kind of a wintry uh, Union Pacific excursion led by E9 locomotives uh, west of Perkins, Colorado on February 15th, 1975. And then for my last pick, um, I pulled this uh, Union Pacific freight train at Sand Creek Junction, Colorado. Um, I particularly enjoyed the, the private property sign uh, featured in the foreground of the image, uh, but Hill shot this one on November 27th, 1971. And then one more collection I'd like to talk about is the Jim McClellan collection. Uh, dating from 1958 to 2003, uh, the collection contains over 25,000 slides, about 13,000 of which are rail related. Um, and most interestingly, uh, it's also got 134 reels of Super 8 film, um, which is kind of a new uh, realm for us. So contract archivist Gil Taylor has surveyed the slides and is now currently exploring a few options for actually getting the movie moving image film digitized. Here you can see him reviewing some on a projector. Um, but once we figure this out, uh, Gil will begin to make selections from the slides for digitization. And also we hope to get you guys some moving image content as well. Um, so that pretty much wraps things up for me. Um, if you want to reach the collections department, you can get at us through the info email account. Uh, we're also quite active on social media. Um, or you can just give me a call.